We have been called in the pastures of God, where there is nature and a place to rest, safety and kindness among all. Let us draw near in the goodness of God to be with each other and to praise the shepherd who has gathered us here. Today is Wednesday, our midweek service, and I'm just saying, let's praise God and thank God for what God has done to us. We are all here to hear the word of God. Let us pray. God of all, transform and shape us by your love. That way we have neglected the needs of others. We may be attentive. Where we have been complacent, we may be active. Where we have shied away from responsibilities, we may embrace all possibilities and may be mindful of all whom you would have us save. For Christ's sake. Amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and read the word of God from Matthew chapter 25. Verses 31 to 46. Good morning, everyone, and I hope you're having a wonderful week. Uh, I'm having a great week. Uh, today's scripture is very challenging. As Johnson mentioned, it's uh, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed in the, in, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Wow, what a verse. All right, we'll get Johnson back up to share his message for this week. And can't wait. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, this morning, I've decided to share with you on the theme, Are You a God? Are You a God? In the language of social media today, artists and sports greats of all kinds often refer themselves as gods. The term means greatest of all time. Once a term reserved for public acclaim of a popular sports and entertainment, figure. Today the term has been used to declare the best of the best, or at least those who believe they are the best. People such as Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, Ronaldo Cristiano, Justin Bieber, 
those icons of their craft who are often universally lauded and praised by others as well as significantly self-proclaimed. The problem with icons, however, is the fine line between honored icon and self-elevated icons, idols. What makes these figures so great often is their punishment of winning. For showmanship, they are supposed to accumulate or of their symbol image of coolness. Those who are gods appear successful. They are passionate winners. But they often too can be seen as viciously competitive, headstrong, deficient, and independent. Michael Jordan, for example, while a sports hero, had also been called a jack by his teammates. He has been identified by men as frequently arrogant, demanding, destructive, even self-destructive, and just plain mean. While Muhammad Ali dazzled people with his antics and acumen, he also was seen as egoistical. In his own ways, Ali told people, it's hard to be humble when you are as great as I am. Ronaldo Cristiano is another example of a star who has been idolized and also villainized during his success. In his own words, he states, there are people out there who hate me and who say I am arrogant, vain, and whatever. That's all part of my success. I made it to be the best. He told Spanish newspaper Mundo Deportivo, in 2016. So Ronaldo is an example of an elite athlete who also very own talent has brought out his arrogance and vanity. Justin Bieber rose to fame due to his talent and humbling beginnings. However, due to him having such great power at such a young age, Bieber was consumed by the world known as Hollywood, partaking in excessive alcohol, drugs, and fighting. It wasn't until recently when Justin Bieber opened up about his battle with power in Hollywood. At one point, Justin was one of the most loved people in the world. He opens up about how quickly the world turned on him after he fell into a state of depression. Due to his lifestyle choices and suddenly was labeled as arrogant, rude, entitled child. Justin reveals that it was the very things that has allowed him to become successful, that has caused him once more a loyal fans to turn on him. While we have venerated those, these idols and smiled at their bold and brash behavior, most of us wouldn't necessarily want to set up house with them because these gods have a pretty goatish personality and not one often tempered towards harmonious relationship and community. Gods in the animal sense have borne this kind of label from the beginning of the scriptures. While sheep are characterized as obedient, gentle, docile, loyal, emotional, sweet-tempered animals, gods are characterized as arrogant, mercurial, independent, strong-willed, destructive, and self-serving creatures. While sheep recognize a shepherd's voice and will submit it to direction and caring. Gods, on the other hand, will often defy the shepherd's guidance, kick, go wrong, and frequently jump the fence. Why Israel, gods and sheep look as surprising similar, dwell in the same flocks. Their personalities and behavior define them as radically different animals. So this difference display themselves most in the roles they serve in the community. Sheep are by nature communal and rational animals. They build friendship with each other. They defend each other and care for each other. They are intrinsically social creatures who are content with what's given them and who feel sad and anxious as a communal group. They go where they are laid and need social interaction. Gods, on the other hand, are by nature curious, independent, and often rebellious. They are indifferent to community, can appear headstrong, unruly, rebellious, and typically seem to think things are better on the other side of the fence. They are mavericks, interested in their own journey, 
and tend towards jealousy and disloyal behavior within their flock. So the shepherd may not be able to tell them apart from their physical looks, but they can tell them apart by their personalities and their flock or anti-flock behavior. Some of the earliest stories we have in scripture attribute different personalities in this sense to attribute of sheep and God. In the story of Cain and Abel, Cain is described as a farmer, attached to his hand, jealous and rough, challenging of God, while Abel is described as a shepherd, is going humble, gracious, and relational. In the story of Jacob and Esau, Esau the farmer is described as hairy, rough, independent, and disloyal to his parents, while Jacob is described as docile, obedient, and stable, shepherd. Both Abel and Jacob are the ones chosen to carry the covenant with God forward through the, to the next generation. Only those with a sheep kind of humility are noted by God to be worthy of the kind of obedience necessary to be an example to the future of God's people. While not all shepherds in scripture have been lauded by God as being good shepherds, still one role of the shepherd is to be able to descend between those who are sheep and those who are sport Gottish personalities. But why? Why does God so definitely distinguish between sheep and gods? Why does Jesus adamantly speak about separating the sheep from the gods? The clue is in his description of the kingdom community. Those who are sheep committed to community care will be the ones feeding the hungry, clothing the needy, caring for the sick, loving each other. The independent, self-willed God will be the ones who refuse, instead of going their own way, serving their own needs. Jesus makes clear that in God's love for all people, community care, the nature and the personality of the flock, is vital to the kingdom, heaven kind of world. So we live in a world today in which we often advocate for a philosophy that says, the ends justifies the means. We believe often today that the behavior doesn't matter, that personality doesn't matter, as long as the desired end goal is achieved, all other things don't matter. Scripture disagrees. Jesus is clear. It matters why we do things. It matters how we do them. It matters that we do them. A flock full of sheep and goats may look the same and even behavior in some similar ways some of the time. But it will be in the real important times, at the most needed moments, in the most challenging times, in the most heart-wrenching situations, that their true hearts will be revealed. Jesus sees us for who we, who we are. Jesus has the ability to look into our hearts and souls so that what dwells beneath our wild and woolly exteriors will be seen. Some of us may seem a bit rough around the edges, but may have the most generous hearts. Others may look like perfect Christians, but when rubber meets the road, their generosity fails and self-serving behavior kicks in. Now, it's not to say that Jesus believes our personalities are just simply black and white. We are a combination of good and less than good decisions good and less than desirable behaviors, and only God can judge us in the end. God will judge us in the end. But I think in this week's scripture, Jesus wants us to ask, to inquire into our own hearts, and to make self-correction where necessary. My question is to you this morning, are you feeling a little goatish today? Are you feeling a little goatish today? Or a little sheepish? Which one? That is the question. I want you to answer yourself. Not me. Answer yourself. Which one do you really feel?
when the judgment day comes, when he's going to separate the sheep and the goats, which one are you? It depends on your character. It depends on what you think God has called you to do. May God bless you this morning. As you digest, as you meditate upon these ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for loving us. We give you thanks, loving God, for those who have ministered to us in our time of need. For those who have visited us when we were ill. Those who have freed us from prisons of fear and lack of confidence. Those who have listened when we have needed to talk. Bless them, encourage them in their ministries. And strengthen us to follow their examples of self-giving and compassionate. We pray for people who are compassionate about others. Even when they are regarded as great in their own sense. Those who think of people who are poor, the marginalized, and to try to empty themselves to support them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May we receive the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.